As with the Episode 7 launchpad phenomena, there tends to be an episode around the same late point in each season that exists to jumpstart that season's third and final act, a bottom drop episode. In Season 2, that episode didn't hit until Akathla's reveal in Bargaining Part 1, but then follows Choices, The Yoko Factor, and now Tough Love. Sidebar, Season 6's bottom drop episode is a doozy. As with Episode 7's, bottom drops tend to share a handful of things in common. The gang will probably turn against each other, the big bad will get strong, Longer, and maybe it all comes together with a minor dash of creak and contrivance. As much as Buffy tends to stick the landing with unbelievable finales, third act bottom drop episodes can feel a smidge more mechanical, as the pieces are moved into place to set up that race to those stellar finales. But I will say that, of the handful, Tough Love is probably my favorite of the bunch. The episode opens with Buffy returning to campus to speak to her teachers, and, as can be the case with the type of traumatic life events we've had at this point in the season, I had pretty much forgotten that Buffy was even in college. Hey, remember Riley was this season? Though life must go on until the daily normal can reset itself, the idea of going back to school at this point in the season still felt silly and insignificant, meaningless in the face of so much grief. Buffy has come by to tell her professor that she needs to drop the class and can't finish the semester, and this professor must not have heard the fates of faculty that are actually nice to Buffy. At least, friendly faculty whose names don't rhyme with smiles. While the fate of the poetry teacher after the scene is never touched on, my money is on tentacle evisceration while pooping. Elsewhere, floppy-haired Benjamin is being fired from his job at the hospital because he's been spending more time as glory than he realized. The parallels between he and Buffy dropping out of what they perceive as their lives are... Not by accident. Buffy gets called to the principal's office because Dawn hasn't been going to class, and despite Buffy's fabulous sweater-scarf ensemble, the principal is unswayed. Buffy goes to Giles for advice on parenting, and for the 971st time, Giles makes me wish he was my dad. Then perk up your ears. She needs you to do this. Buffy goes a little too hard on Dawn, and Dawn doesn't appreciate it. Will pleads Dawn's case to Buffy, and while I can empathize with all of the emotions in this scene, I think everyone could afford to get their head out of their hecates. Willow's approach here lacks any recognition of the weight of this new responsibility Buffy must be carrying. Who's gonna take care of us? And reminds me a little bit of when she once told Buffy that she really needed to find the fun. Buffy? And Buffy lets smoldering resentment for having to drop out of school and being pulled to the principal's office push her to drop a little bit of a martyr bomb. It's not like I don't have a life. I do. I have Dawn's life. Glory and company have a new theory as to who the key is, which the scene leaves deliberately vague. Tara brings the empathy for Buffy that Willow was missing earlier. Willow doesn't take it well, and the conversation spins out of Tara's grasp. It, it frightens me how powerful you're getting. I frighten you? This scene hits a little too real for me, but painful though it is, I like it. With every fiber of my being, I feel the pain and panic of each fueling escalation here, until the fire gets hot enough that two people start saying things they don't mean, or worse, can't take back. And sometimes it's tough to bear in mind that, canonically, Willow is barely 21. These are two people not only figuring out who they are, but the love they're both worthy of receiving. As we've mentioned in previous conversations about Willow this season, though, scenes like this tend to be guilty of some bi erasure, something the writers even admitted. Dawn rebels against Buffy's first attempts at parenting, and Buffy finally explains to her what the principal threatened her with when Dawn wasn't in the room. They'll take you away! This is good drama, though I also wonder if a little truancy would be enough to take a kiddo from their guardian, albeit their 20-something guardian. There are a lot worse parents out there than Buffy. Though I suppose that doesn't mean an authority figure wouldn't capitalize on Buffy's ignorance of the law by threatening her with taking Dawn. Anyway, at the fair they were supposed to go to together, a very upset Tara is sitting alone by herself. Glory comes along thinking Tara was the key, but no dice. And, you know, Buffy is a pretty violent series with all the punchy-kicky action. But between this and the spin-off, I always remember the hand thing as one of the most agonizing and grotesque acts of violence in the show. The only thing that tops it for me won't be along for another couple of seasons. All alone. 
Willow shows up too late to prevent Glory from sapping Tara's brainy bits. At the hospital, Buffy says she can stay with the witches as long as they need because Dawn is safe with a very badly beaten Spike. And in what proves to be something of a habit for Spike with the Summer's women, he ends up being the safe space Dawn needs to unburden herself of what she's really worried about. Buffy thinks that she has convinced Willow not to go after Glory. Spike, as usual, highlights some of the Scooby naivete. So she's not going to do anything rash, though. I'd do it. Right person. Person I loved. I'd do it. It might not be that bad. Maybe it's padlock to keep things out. Or darkest means it's for spells you should only do at night. How bad can magic with a K be anyway? That spelling is delightful. <laughs> Never mind. Floaty pissed off Willow actually does some damage until Glory breaks her everything. Willow spits the world's gooberiest glob onto Glory's face. I mean, seriously. I think all the black magic may have left her a little dehydrated. Buffy saves the day. Everything seems safe as Buffy, Willow, Dawn, and Tara have a dorm room picnic over a peaceful score. But Buffy is wearing black leather pants, so you can be pretty certain that something bad is about to happen. And the episode ends with Glory removing a wall and brain-sucked Tara revealing the identity of the key. Such pure green energy. I find tough love fittingly hard to watch, but only because, you know... I love these characters. I love the Scoobies. Seeing them fight is just, well, tough. But unlike certain Scoobies at war with themselves type episodes, I'm thinking most specifically of Dead Man's Party or Yoko Factor, the conflict between them here feels both earned and driven by understandable character choices. Where most of Dead Man's Party felt like it could have been avoided with a simple open conversation that the episode's plot kept contriving reasons for everyone not to have, the conversations in Tough Love actually keep making things worse because each character is dealing with their own unexamined fears or expectations. I'm saying everything wrong. And their reactions make sense to me, as opposed to them arbitrarily placing so much trust in a known manipulator and former big bad that they skip the conversation and go right to attacking each other. A character departure so self-evidently stupid that the next episode immediately mocks it. I'm very stupid. Buffy's familiarity with leadership is through slaying. She is the commander. It makes sense that her first attempts at parenting Dawn might be militant. Willow and Buffy love each other, but Willow has expressed her insecurity about being in Buffy's shadow more than once. I'm not your sidekick. Oh, wow. We're already getting in the way. We're pretty good at this, Xander, huh? It makes sense that she might have an automatic reaction to Tara not immediately taking her side in a conflict with Buffy. This is the point in the series when I begin to swoon over almost every word that comes out of Spike's mouth. Hi. It must be something so horrible to cause so much pain and evil. I'm a vampire. I know something about evil. You're not evil. But I stick to my conviction that what we're watching here is not him learning to be good, but a romantic hedonist bloodsucker not being allowed to do evil and craving the same things he always had. I told Willow it would be like suicide. I'd do it. Right person. That's not loved. That's not new information. We already knew that Spike would rather murder the target of his affections than be rejected by them. You know, what I should just do is get rid of both. Or, if he can't do that, be killed by them. She wouldn't even kill me. She didn't even care enough to cut off my head or set me on fire. Almost every scene between Dawn and Spike in the series is a banger, and Dawn's existential ruminations on her own inherent nature is definitely one of my favorites. I think this is a super solid performance from Michelle Trachtenberg, and I loved Dawn having a moment to speak about what all of this is doing to her own sense of self. I'm like a lightning rod for pain and hurt. I love Anya's capitalist peanut gallery throughout the episode. Love the faintest ripper hints we get. What happened? He changed his mind. I've always felt like Glory was one of the scarier big bads in the series, but it may have been tough to understand why until the past couple of episodes. I mean, yes, she's strong, but Buffy has taken blows from a lot of nasties over the years. Is she giant snake strong or gravel gargling Franken soldier strong? These are lies. Who can say? But this is the point in the show where Glory starts to feel more like the Terminator to me. Actually, she's already felt like the Rise of the Machines Terminator, so I guess I'm talking more Terminator 1. That Terminator is out there. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse. And it absolutely will not stop until you are dead. A terrifying, unstoppable force that is slowly and steadily draining all will to keep fighting from our protagonists. That hasn't existed yet. Vampires are essentially more 
vulnerable than humans. Turning into one actually adds a whole extra host of ways they can die, including basic sunlight. And the message of the show has often been get enough people together, including bow and arrow wielding children, and there isn't anything that can stop them. But during the queeze inducing park bench sequence, Glory makes the stakes clear. I'll kill her and. And then I'll kill him and her and her. <laughs> kind of funny, isn't it? All these people here and no one can do a thing. Glory can do whatever she wants. It is genuinely terrifying, and Willow running to them but constantly being obstructed is pure nightmare fuel. It's not perfect. The last scene of the episode feels like an inelegant 11th hour addition to the script added to get the pieces into place. It's a little convenient, this specific foursome all being in this exact place at this time. But the location makes it more confusing. Buffy both dropped out and moved home. Willow and Tara moved in together. In a very designed and specific shot from three episodes ago, we saw that Willow and Tara's room is on the upper floor. So whose first floor dorm room is this that Buffy, Willow, and a befuddled Tara and Dawn are all hanging out in and picnicking in the middle of the day? My guess is the spectacle of Glory tearing the wall off was a lot cheaper to execute on this set than it would have been at the Summer's House or the Magic Box, where it would have made a little more sense. But likewise, destroying the wall of one of those locations, ones that come with some such a feeling of safety and permanence would have done a lot to heighten the feelings of no one being safe from glory any place. Some of the parallels between characters this season are more and more clear, and the themes can be seen in their remaining contrasts. Ben leaves his job because he is spending more time as Glory. This is, this is my life and you're ruining it! Buffy leaves school to be a better caretaker for Dawn. It's not like I don't have a life. I do. I have Dawn's life. The difference between them is Buffy is choosing to drop out of school, even if she still hasn't made peace with the hard choices. And I love her admiration for Giles's adultnessness. You're so much more grown up than me. Given that we've seen direct evidence of the fact that he wasn't always. Ooh, Copper's got a gun. No one is birthed into the world complete, and we don't cross a line somewhere in our 20s to find we've arrived at adult. We shape ourselves into the people we are by making choices, or circumstances will do the shaping for us. Which brings us to Willow. This episode is a significant one for the Rosenberg, and I realized watching it that I've suffered something of a Mandela effect when it comes to her. Specifically, I've been misremembering the very first episode where Willow's eyes turned black upon casting a spell. In Becoming, after Giles tells Willow that casting a soul restoration spell might open a door she'd be unable to close, she insisted. But his warning implies that casting magic potentially leaves an indelible mark on the caster. And while being watched by Cordy and Oz, something channeled through her her, and I was sure that she looked up, looked forward, and had black eyes during the remainder of the spell. But no, still, the door was open. And in Willow's case, what that has meant so far is magic becoming her number one coping mechanism. Magic has been a metaphor for a few things, but one of its analogs, set up early on by Giles' abuse of it to get high in the Dark Age, was drugs. A metaphorical connection between magic and alcohol was made in Something Blue, when Willow first tried to deal with her grief over eyes by way of a sick Bud Light dance party. Will, not loving the drowning of the sorrows. She has resorted to magic to cope with her lust, to cope with her anger, to cope with her grief, and in tough love, her rage. Historically, there has usually been a scene afterwards where she suffers guilt for the spell's misfire and bakes a round of apology cookies. Eat a cookie, ease my pain. But the episode always stops just short of her learning the actual lesson. Her regret is never specifically for the use of magic to solve her problems, but for the fact that she wasn't capable enough to pull the spell off the way she wanted to. If I had any real power, I could have made Oz stay with me. And everyone tends to let it slide. On to the next episode. Heck, Buffy said more to Jonathan and Superstar than she has ever said to Willow. Jonathan, you get why everyone is angry though, right? It's not just the monster. People didn't like being the little actors in your sock puppet theater. Because Willow is just in pain, angry, lonely, lost. That's all. It's a familiar pattern with abuse-based coping mechanisms, given there always tends to be a lot going on for that person. Big things that their friends and family members see as what actually drove their loved ones to this. I just can't stand feeling this way. And that big thing feels more important right now than confronting the loved one about their little problem. Now is not the time. Now is never the time. 
and then time slips past. But Willow has continued to become more powerful with every passing season, and in Tough Love, her breaking into the magic box and channeling actual black magic I think represents a turning point. This is the first time her eyes actually turn black, and if every spell leaves an indelible mark upon the caster, there is something in her now that she will always have to carry. But in keeping with Willow learning the wrong lesson, or none whatsoever, the final scene in the episode follows the pattern we've seen to this point. Scooby's feeling bad for what Willow must be going through, conversations about consequences not being had, and Willow feeling defeated and depressed. If the pattern fits, not just because of Terra's state, but because Willow wasn't strong enough to wield the necessary power to properly take her revenge wasn't strong enough yet. Eat a cookie, ease my pain. Look, I'm sorry this is hard for you, but I told you what I need. So I can't help feeling like the reason you want to talk is so you can feel better about yourself. That's not my problem. <laughs> 